Our second speaker of this session is Jacob Kirsch from the University of Ottawa. He was hoping for a little extra time, but I'm not sure he's going to get so much after the talk and the time it took us to get started. Um, Jacob is an associate professor at the University of Ottawa in the Department of Physics and the Department of uh, the School of Engineering and Computer Science. He's a theoretical condensed matter physicist, focusing mainly on novel pathways to high efficiency photovoltaics and nonlinear spectroscopies for organic uh, systems. His BA in physics is from Strathmore College in Pennsylvania. He followed that with an MMAT from Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He received his PhD in theoretical physics, condensed matter physics, from Harvard University. And after his PhD, he was a ZIF Fellow at Harvard University Center for Environmental Science and a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Harvard. In 2012, he came to the University of Ottawa and he was awarded an Ontario Minister of Research, Innovation and Science Early Researcher Award for his contribu contributions to the no field of novel photovoltaics in 2018. He's reputed to be an absolutely superb professor and teacher and I'm looking forward very much to his talk. Jacob. Thank you very much for the extremely generous introduction. I don't know if I'll be able to live up to it. Uh, <laughs> and I, I just want to thank Paul and Bob for the invitation to come to the Charlottetown Symposium. I have been enjoying the Charlottetown Symposium since I arrived in Ottawa in 2012, and it is a real honor and a privilege to be able to present my work here uh, this year. So um, as Paul mentioned, I'm a theoretical physicist, and I'm going to describe some of the work that my group has been doing on the development of high efficiency photovoltaics. I'm going to start out by talking about what the limits of photovoltaic efficiency are, and then the fun part is how we can in principle break them. I'm going to talk about two particular ideas about how we can do that, which are intermediate band solar cells and ratchet band solar cells. And uh, this will be a theory experiment theory sandwich. So we'll, we'll start and end with the, uh, the theoretical parts, but there will, not be, there will be just one big equation in here and otherwise it'll just be um, nice ideas. Uh, so before I get started, I really just want to let people know who haven't been following about what's happening in the solar energy industry in the world. So back in 2010, the total amount of solar panels that had been installed in the entire world was less than 50 gigawatts of capacity. And just 10 years later, there are more than 10 times more capacity of solar power in the world. That has been transformative for renewable energy, for the fight against climate change. And all of that is built, essentially all of it is built on silicon solar cells which are the market leader right now. And um, when I started in this field, everybody thought we needed to get higher efficiency to be able to enable exactly this kind of growth. But it may be that we can solve all of the climate change, pro change problems with the technologies that we currently have. I still work on trying to improve the efficiency of our solar cells. Why? Partially because I think the questions are very interesting. Partially because I hope that we'll be able to make it even less expensive. And partially because when we go and we make global scale electric generation from the sun, extra efficiency means we needed to cover less of our planet with the solar panels, which can be important at global scale. But just to say that what I'm going to describe here is not something that I say is required in order to solve all of our climate issues. I'm not going to talk about climate anymore. What I do want to talk about is fundamentally how efficiently can we convert light into electricity. I'm going to talk about uh, devices. So our efficiency is the electrical power out or, intensi or, or power density out, so the current density times the voltage, divided by the uh, optical intensity that has come in. Now the optical intensities relevant to me are several orders of magnitude smaller than the ones that Gerard Moreau spoke about on Wednesday, um, but let's consider one of his favorite systems. So we're going to start with just a laser and say how well could we convert it to electricity? 
The answer to that was worked out by Martin Green back in 2001. And this is an example of, 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 a, um, of these limits, the fundamental limit for the efficiency conversion of monochromatic light. And this is for two different example lasers at 850 or 1310 nanometers. Now, this, this calculation assumes that the light is monochromatic, that our device absorbs all of it, that it has no non-radiative losses. There's no extra heat being produced inside. There's no resistance and the device absorbs absorbs only this monochromatic energy, only at that energy. Now, why is this not 100%? We're absorbing everything and our, our, our system seems to be perfect. And the answer is that our device not only absorbs photons, but it also has to emit them. This is the same thing as Einstein's A and B coefficients, only in a solid state context. If we absorb light, time reversal symmetry for our material says we're going to have to emit it. Some of those emitted photons will leave. That's a loss process. As we have higher intensity, Density, we can approach 100% efficiency, but we cannot do it at lower intensity light. So just to give for scale here, um, not talking about QED processes, sunlight, though it is not monochromatic, is about, under full sunlight, um, about 1,000 watts per square meter. Now, the highest efficiency monochromatic uh, conversion device was uh, made by Simon Fafar, who is known to many of us in collaboration with Karen Hinzer's group here at the University of Ottawa. That was a 70% device operating close to 850 nanometers and at this power density. You could see that they're actually getting appreciably close to the, the fundamental limit, but one of the things that I have been working on along with my graduate student Daisy, Karen's group, and some collaborators in Waterloo and recently at Fraunhofer is to improve the efficiency of this monochromatic conversion and also to expand out to different wavelengths. I'm not going to talk any more about monochromatic conversion. I'm going to switch to solar conversion. The main problem of converting sun the sunlight is that uh, sunlight has too many colors. So this is the photon flux as a function of photon energy arriving just above our atmosphere. So if you were a satellite, this is what you would see. It's just a little cleaner for, for discussion today. So the problem is we have all of the monochromatic problems, which is to say the radiative emission, but we add two extra problems to it. These are transparency and thermalization. So if we have a lower energy uh, photon compared to the absorption edge, the band gap of our material, then we just can't absorb it. We're not having any nonlinear optical processes. This is not a high harmonic generation kind of thing. This is just in linear uh, absorption. Uh, we, we can't absorb these photons. And so that's a loss. So that says we want to have a small band gap in order to absorb a lot of these photons. But if we have a higher energy photon to take an electron from deep in the valence band, move it up to high in the conduction band, we quickly lose the energy. The electron falls down to the edge, the hole rises up to the valence band, and that's a loss. What that means is that our voltage is limited to be less than this band gap. So we need to have a high band gap if we want to have a high voltage. When you put these three problems together, transparency, thermalization, and radiative emission, you end up with the most famous limit in solar energy, which is the Shockley-Quiser limit, worked out by Shockley and Quiser in the early 60s. And it says that if you have these rules, these optimistic assumptions, the maximum efficiency that you can get under concentrated sunlight is 41%, unconcentrated sunlight is 31%. Now, those are just the optimum, but it depends on what is the band gap of your material. So if we just look a little more broadly at the Shockley-Quiser limit, this is for a black body spectrum, a model spectrum for the sun, what you can see is that in order to achieve a 25% efficiency, you really need to consider materials that are between 0.8 EV as a band gap and 1.8 EV as a band gap. And that indeed is basically the range that people look at for solar energy. So I mentioned that silicon is the, is the leader. This is the record efficiency that has been achieved by a silicon solar cell. The highest efficiency has been achieved in gallium arsenide, but it's not cost competitive with silicon. The, the newest and hottest material on the scene is these uh, uh, metal organic hybrid uh, perovskite materials, which are coming up rapidly behind. These are the record efficiencies achieved for each of these. In particular for gallium arsenide, they're butting up close on this thermodynamic limit. So, of course, someone gives a limit, what we want to do is to break it. So there's one way you can do that right now that's commercial, you can buy it, which is to go buy a multi-junction solar cell. You can take a bunch of different semiconductors with different band gaps, stack them on top of each other, and the record efficiency there is over 47%. 
Um, but uh, they're, they're expensive, they exist, and as a theoretical physicist, uh, we understand how they work very well. So I'm going to talk about one of the ideas that does not yet work well. There's about five other ideas in the community about how we can break the Shockley-Quiser limit. None of them works yet. None of them is a commercial project um, product. I am going to speak about the intermediate band solar cell. So the intermediate band idea is to make a new modified semiconductor. So it has a conduction band and a valence band and a new set of allowed electronic energy levels deep inside the band gap. So what that allows us to do is to absorb higher energy photons wherever it is they may appear inside the device. But we can also absorb two subgap photons to move an electron from valence to intermediate. This is not a nonlinear optics process. That electron can hang around in here for some amount of time before it gets absorbed, but, but gets, it get, absorbs another uh, lower energy photon to move that electron up to the conduction band. We can then get the current out and ideally set our voltage by this larger band gap than we have over here in the shockley quiser limit. So this allows us to turn a larger portion of the spectrum into current at a higher voltage. And using the same kind of techniques that Shockley and Quiser did, Luque and Marti in 1997 showed that in each case, concentrated and unconcentrated light, we could in principle get 50% higher efficiency. Now, the problem is, what are these materials? They don't exist in nature. What, how do we work? And then how do we get it so we actually approach the limits that are, that, are, that are obtained here? So what I'm gonna show is the progress that we're making toward realizing these efficiencies, but we are far from it. The most efficient intermediate band solar cell is less than 20% efficient right now. Okay, so this shows what range of materials we're interested in for intermediate band solar cells. Our horizontal axis is the band gap of our material, and the vertical axis tells us how far up in the gap is the intermediate band, so as a fraction of the band gap. This is exactly the same in principle if we put the intermediate band down in the bottom half of the gap, so this whole image can just be reflected down. So I'm only showing the top half going from 0.5 to 1. Now I've drawn on here this 30% contour. This 30% contour is not hugely important, but what it does is it really separates where it's interesting to have a novel concept. Outside of that region, you're just gonna make a gallium arsenide solar cell. It's gonna be better. They're almost at 30% now. Inside of here is where we have a real chance to be better than the solar cells that are being sold excuse me, on the market right now. So the maximum efficiency of about 47% occurs here at about 2.4 EV. And I just wanna show you, um, so first of all, I wanna say this calculation for a couple technical reasons I'd be happy to describe is not accurate for intermediate bands down in the middle. It's unnecessarily pessimistic. Um, so please don't pay attention to that poor region, but up here it is a quite accurate um, optimal efficiency that we can achieve the color scale being the, the, opti the uh, efficiency that could be achieved by these devices. So the, um, some of the intermediate band devices that have been made so far are quantum dot systems. So the most studied one is gallium arsenide with indium arsenide quantum dots. So that's a small region of indium arsenide inside of gallium arsenide. And I've just shown not the efficiency of these, but where they appear on the band gap space, if you just take them as an intermediate band and as a semiconductor. Um, and then there's also this uh, hybrid perovskite, methyl ammonium lead bromide, bromide with lead sulfide quantum dots, which you can see as a band gap perspective is extremely close to our optimal band gaps. There are highly mismatched alloys. There's also putting a lot of dopants into silicon to try to marginally increase the silicon efficiency that people work on. But most of the systems that people study, you can see have band gaps that are to the left of this optimal band gap. And what I'm going to describe today is some reasons to think that this region over to the right at higher band gaps than people normally consider is actually interesting. In fact, what I'm going to say is that gallium nitride, which we heard so much about in the last talk, is a very interesting material. Its band gap is all the way up here at 3.5. So keep your eye on that. Okay, so what do we need to make an intermediate band solar cell? And in particular, what don't we have in our current materials? The two things we need, in addition to well-chosen band gaps, are that it has to absorb the subgap radiation, and we have to be able to collect the carriers that we get out before they recombine. So we have an electron up in the conduction band, we need to be able to extract it into our device uh, before it falls back down to the intermediate band. So um, along with some collaborators, I proposed a dimensionless figure of merit to characterize how good a material is at these two um, 
uh, conditions, and this will guide materials development. So this is just KT, the temperature and the electric charge. The operative part is over here. So we have the carrier mobility and the lifetime for either an electron in the conduction band or a hole in the valence band. And this mu tau product characterizes how well we can extract the carrier before it recombines. This, uh, we need to choose whichever one is worse because we have to extract both the electron and the hole. But then we also have to absorb our light. So this is the subgap absorption coefficient, uh, which we again need to choose for this figure of merit, whichever one is worse, this, this valence to intermediate band or intermediate to conduction band transition. This whole thing put together is dimensionless and we take it as a measure of material quality. So we can do work to make that quality better. But ideally what we would like to say is let's work in a material where we don't need a high figure of merit to get high efficiency. So that as a prediction is a great theoretical problem. So what I wanna say is that the challenge of modeling intermediate band solar cells is that they're not semiconductors. And we have a huge set of tools for modeling semiconductors that we just can't use on a three band system because they didn't program them in. At this point, I bury over three years of development work of a beautiful Poisson drift diffusion um, model that, uh, that treats self-consistent optical absorption, has all kinds of other bells and whistles that I'm not going to describe. It's available free and open source um, on GitHub. It was developed by Edward Dumitrescu and Matt Wilkins primarily in my group. We're extremely proud of it and I'm not going to talk more about it except to say that we used it to verify that in some devices we can use a simpler model, which I will describe, which we would not, it's actually so simple we wouldn't have believed it if we didn't have this better model to verify it. So that simpler model is, uh, in, is this modified Strandberg model. It's, it's uh, characterized by this, uh, this long equation up at the top, which is a, an equation to tell us what is the current density as a function of voltage in an intermediate band device. Now, once we know the current density as a function of voltage, we can analyze everything about the efficiency of our devices. So I, I'm not gonna go into full detail about this. I just wanna say that this, this form was proposed by Strandberg uh, in 2017. It just has a couple technical assumptions we have infinite carrier mobility, and there's not too many carriers in our conduction and valence bands. What those let us do is to relate the voltages in our device to the recombination processes. But let me just say briefly, because I'm going to describe what happens with this model, what are the pieces of it? So we have a generation term for optical absorption from the valence band to the conduction band inside of our device. We also have generation from the intermediate band to produce electrons in the conduction band, and similarly to produce holes in the valence band by moving electrons up to the intermediate band. You can see that these generation terms also appear in this bad term, this negative term, when they're mismatched. If these red and green arrows don't move the same number of electrons, then they are competing and the intermediate band um, has a uh, it gets um, less efficient. So we want those to be well matched. Now, we also have recombination processes, which are these things that we need to avoid, but they are essential. So when Strandberg wrote this model, he only considered the radiative parts. But these are the terms that are characterized by these strengths and the voltages. That's what these assumptions allow us technically to relate to each other. So what we did is we modified Strandberg's model to include non-radiative processes and also to include the fact that it depends on how thick this device is. As your intermediate band region gets thicker, you can absorb more light, but your carriers have to move farther. So for example, this hole is going to diffuse around until it just happens to wander to this electric field in the junction where we collect it. But this electron has farther to go. And while it is diffusing, it may not make it. It may have a recombination process. We don't collect it. We include that physics, which is essential. So then what we can do is we can use this model, optimize the width of our um, of our uh, intermediate band device and study it at a range of different figures of merit, because all of the parameters in the figure of merit appear in this model. So what are the results that we get? So this is the same axes that I was showing before. This is the band gap of our material and the position of the intermediate band inside the gap. And what this shows in color is something funny. So it's the lowest figure of merit 
that you could have that can give you a 30% efficiency. So I'm just taking 30% as this benchmark of it's interesting to be there. So this gray line around the outside is the fundamental limit. When, when the figure of merit goes to infinity, then the boundary here is this is what used to be a black and is now this gray dashed line. Inside there is where we can in principle beat 30% efficiency, but you can see the required material quality, the required figure of merit goes up to a thousand over at these boundaries and near the optimum, it can be down closer to three or four. So let's put up, put up again the materials that people are studying. Again, you should ignore this part down here, which is unnecessarily pessimistic. You can see that this gallium arsenide device in principle can get over 30%, but you're gonna have to make it with a material quality that gives a figure of merit of up about a thousand. This perovskite device will only require something that's much closer to five or six in order to potentially break 30%. So it's an avenue that shows um, uh, where it is interesting. You'll note if you have a lot of attention that you've paid a very good visual memory that this low figure of merit region has extended out to even higher band gap than the raw optimum. So what we have is that the least stringent material quality requirements occur at the large band gap, even out as far as what we get for, for gallium nitride. So let me describe, before I talk about work on gallium nitride itself, let me describe how we know that we have an intermediate band device. So I'm describing, uh, this is from an experiment, I'm going to describe a little bit more, but what I want to describe is how we measure the quantum efficiency. The quantum efficiency is uh, you shine light on the sample and you measure in the electrical current how many electrons do we get out for every photon that we put in. So you want that to be close to one. So the setup for that, this was set up by Ross Cheriton in uh, Karen Hinzer's group. It's a collaboration with Zetian Mi's group, who is now at the University of Michigan. Take a broadband lamp and chop it. There's a monochromator, which allows you to shine your light onto the sample. You can measure all the different reflectances and know the power of the incident beam. And so you can measure how the electrical current out and, and have a calibrated um, source for the photons in, you can also add a bias laser, something that does not have enough energy to promote electrons all the way from valence to conduction band. And you can see whether the two photons together give you current. That's the intermediate band process. So historically, what we have is a set of different materials that have shown this process. And these have been, because in 1997, when the intermediate band was uh, really proposed in its modern form, we didn't really have any examples of it. So in 2006, um, Marti showed that he can get this from the indium arsenide, gallium arsenide dots. But just to show here, this is the photocurrent. This is the response to the primary beam. This is the change that they get when they add the infrared. And you can see they measure it. It's there. There's two photon photocurrent, but it's four orders of magnitude smaller than what they get from the primary beam itself. Now, over here on the gallium nitride arsenide system, the subgap region is this portion that is labeled with the one and two, and their change in the quantum efficiency when they add in this IR bias light compared to not having it is down at you know a fraction of a percent in this uh, perovskite sample, they have a couple different concentrations of quantum dots. The, the change in the quantum efficiency here is on a scale of 10 to the minus 5. So none of these, and this is a short circuit current change in zinc telluride oxide, it's not quite quantum efficiency, um, but none of these have a very strong intermediate band signal. So what I want to describe is the work that we've recently published on this gallium nitride system. So gallium nitride has this large band gap of 3.5 eV. It was grown by molecular beam epitaxy in Zetian Mi's group on a silicon substrate. There's a forest of gallium nitride nanowires. Inside each nanowire, there's a set of 10 indium gallium nitride quantum dots. So indium is put inside there that decreases the band gap. It de how much depends on how much indium is there. These are approximately two electrons electron volt band gap uh, quantum dots. They were originally developed to be light emitting diodes and we are studying to adapt this structure to be a solar cell. So the interesting thing, one of the interesting thing about gallium nitride is that the group three nitrides are very strongly piezoelectric. If you can see the dots inside here, what I'm showing is that the indium gallium nitride system has a larger lattice constant than the gallium nitride system does. So there's strain at the boundary, which causes a piezoelectric potential to develop, which is predominantly oriented in this case along the growth axis of these nanowires. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. But first, what I wanna do is just show the 
sample. So this is it inside, this is our chip inside of a cryostat. So right now it's being operated as an LED. So that orange is emission coming from the nanowires. This is the tunable beam that if uh, Ross were actually measuring the quantum efficiency would be overlaid on top of our little device over here. You can't see the 850 nanometer IR bias light that is used. This is all inside of a cryostat. And here is the, the uh, quantum efficiency as a function of tunable beam wavelength, both with and without the light bias added at two different temperatures. So in both cases, you can see that our quantum efficiencies are, so above gap is right over here, just this leftmost portion of, of this setup, um, which is a, a few percent here. But what I want to draw your attention to is the extra quantum efficiency that we get for adding the light bias is measurable on here without going down by orders of magnitude. It is a uh, decent, uh, it's a, it's a 15 or 20% increase in the quantum efficiency that comes from this two photon process. Now, that is not to say that these are efficient solar cells. They are less than 1% efficient under uh, the solar spectrum. What we would really like is to have this quantum efficiency that's above gap go up to 100%. And we want this light biased efficiency uh, with the two photon process to also go up to 100%. So we still have a lot to do to approach that, but this is the strongest two photon intermediate band signal of which I'm aware in the field. So we're very pleased with this as progress toward this goal. Now, in the, in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to share a new idea. So we have our intermediate band, and then I'm going to add um, a new concept to it, which is a ratchet band. So in our intermediate band, we have one set of states deep inside the band gap. In 2012, Yoshida and Ned Eakins Docks at Imperial College London proposed, why don't, why don't we not have one band in the middle of our semiconductor, but two? in a way where we absorb light to bring an electron to the intermediate band, but that electron will relax down to this ratchet. But this ratchet has to have the special property that this electron will not recombine when it's there. Instead, it will wait until it gets absorbed up to the conduction band and we can then collect it. So we sacrifice some energy in this intermediate band in exchange for decreasing recombination, which is one of the limiting problems for intermediate band solar cells. The problem with this, as with most intermediate band things, is, okay, I can draw this. I mean, as a theorist, I love this. We can study the ultimate efficiency for it, but what is that? What realizes this access over here and turning off that recombination? So the best example in the literature was published recently from the same group at Imperial College that did the original study. It's a molecular beam epitaxy quantum cascade laser structure with beautiful quantum wells where they absorb on the left side, the electron tunnels through, it waits on the right, gets a second absorption to come out. They see a very nice uh, two photon photocurrent, but unfortunately only at a very narrow bandwidth that is not relevant to the solar spectrum and at very low temperature. So there's no way to move this up, though it's a great demonstration of a ratchet. Uh, so this electron and this hole are very far apart from each other. They won't recombine, but there's no way to move that clearly into a, uh, into a real device. So what I wanna propose here is a concept where we use this very large piezoelectric field inside this gallium nitride system. So this is a cartoon of the sort of pancake shaped dots from the experiments that Ross Cheriton did that were just published this summer. So what I want to describe is, is a proposal that's been made by my PhD student, Luc Robuchot, who has been working on modeling these systems for a number of years. And that proposal is to, instead of making pancakes, we make nanopillars. And what that allows us to do is to look, if we take the band edges here on, a, on an axis going right through the center, this is where I, again, bury years of development to be able to draw these pictures that Luc has developed and say that he's also included the effects of indium diffusion, which actually happens. The indium surfaces are not sharp as I've, as I've cartooned them on the right. Here we have the conduction band edge and the valence band edge. So we absorb a photon, we produce our electron and hole, they get separated by this strong piezoelectric field, and now they're on opposite sides of the dot. The electron is up at the top, the hole is down at the bottom, so they can't recombine easily when they are that separated. These are the wave functions of the lowest energy states inside of these quantum dots. And what we have in this system is that we consider all of the states in this region to be the intermediate band, 
the hole can get out by thermal excitation, and we need to absorb another photon to lift this electron up to the energetic states where it can leave into the conduction band of the gallium nitride, where we actually are going to have our contacts. So Luke has also calculated the optical absorption cross-section for these quantum dots. There's a region inside here which is just intraband. That doesn't help. It moves to another intermediate band state, but you can see here that we have our two separate subgap absorption processes, one in red for our intermediate to conduction band and one in green for our valence to intermediate band. Together, when Luke puts this through the model, this particular device we predict has an efficiency of about 28% if everything is working right. That's not quite as high as we like. We're working to optimize. Luke is working to optimize the exact size and shape to be able to do better than that. But we're really optimistic that this is a realizable room temperature ratchet band concept that will see this separation because the electron over here and the hole over here should not be able to recombine rapidly. So just to recap, intermediate and ratchet band solar cells have a high potential efficiency and they haven't yet been achieved. What we want to do is to explore out in this high band gap region and in particular to use that to make some ratchet bands. So I'd again like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me and I'm very happy to take any questions. Well, I think I'm on, but I'm not positive. I don't see an image, so I'm not sure. But I think I am, and so let's join, let's thank you. I'll do it virtually. I'll clap, but uh, others cannot. And uh, I think we have Sean Cedarberg standing by to read out the questions on the Q and A. I see there's one there. Ah, uh, yes, I, I see myself, and you too. Great. Uh, so. Thanks, Paul, and. Thank you, uh, Professor Critch, for this very fascinating talk. Um, so we, I'll remind everyone, uh, Professor Critch is uh, with us here uh, live, so um, you can type in your questions at the, uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and I'll uh, read them out. Um, so to start with, we have one from someone who came in uh, late and wasn't sure uh, if his uh, question had actually been answered. Um, but it comes from Zahir, and the question is, is there a thermodynamic limit on how efficient the intermediate band solar cells can be? Um, yes, there is. Um, so at, uh, at, if we fully concentrate our light, then it's 63%, and if we don't, then it's uh, 47%. Okay. So pretty good. Yeah, I mean, that, that's why we're, we're pursuing them um, as ideas. We haven't come close to uh, achieving it. Okay, thanks. Um, no other questions at the moment. Um, maybe I can fill in uh, with one of my own. Uh, this comes from someone with uh, no background in photovoltaics, uh, so it might be a naive question. Um, but uh, I thought one uh, thought I had about this uh, intermediate uh, band solar cell is that once you put electrons in the intermediate band, um, is there anything preventing high energy photons from exciting them to the conduction band and for this excess energy being lost through thermalization? Um, so is this a concern and to what uh, extent does it influence the efficiency? That, that, that is an extremely perceptive question. Um, so yes, so what I've done, which I buried under the rug here when I was making my efficiencies, is that the, the efficiency limits are done assuming that we forbid that process. So what we do is we say that for every photon, it can be absorbed by only one transition. And we choose that transition to be the highest energy transition compatible with conservation of energy. And that's the ideal. That's not true in any real system. That's actually the fault of that gray bar that I put that I said, don't mm -hmm. pay attention these because when the intermediate band gets close to the center, what that, that assumption, what it does is it means that one of your transitions gets all the photons and the other one has no photons left. And so that mismatch causes those efficiencies to be underestimated. So it turns out that you can get a slightly higher, I'm actually a, in, in that region, a significantly higher efficiency when you allow um, the two transitions to compete for photons. But you're totally right. It's a loss process. And it's one of those things that will happen in any real device. Now, what I showed at the very end, um, I, I mean, I could put it back up, but I don't, I don't think I need to, is that in the... Um, 
in our in our calculations in Luke's calculations for the indium gallium nitride system, those two absorption transitions are actually nearly non overlapping by the time we get to high enough energy photons to go from valence to intermediate band, the densities of states are so much higher for that, that that really overwhelms it. And so we don't in that system have this problem of overlapping absorptions, but, it, but it's, a, it's a very perceptive question and a real issue, um, which I, I wish that that were the limiting problem that we had in these devices. If, if that became the limiting problem, uh, we would be in better shape. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, sounds like very uh, rich and interesting physics there. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Jacob, thank you. Uh, this is Bob Boyd. Uh, the, the way we have the website set up is that organizers cannot type questions into the <laughs> answer field because we're the experts. We're supposed to answer the questions, not ask. <laughs> so, uh, and maybe for the future now, maybe that's something we will change. But, but my question is this. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, the world needs to decide what fraction of our surface area wants to be covered by, uh, by these solar cells. And could you tell us more about that? I, certainly, I understand it from an aesthetic point of view, but uh, is there anything deeper? I mean, there's, you know, how much time do we have? Um, so I, um, as some people who know me know that I'm, I'm, a, I'm an energy geek and would love to talk about these kind of scaling questions uh, all day. So let, let me try to keep it brief. Um, so right now, uh, the entire world uses an average of about two terawatts of electricity. So we use several more uh, terawatts by including all energy, for example, the gasoline in the cars and industrial processes. But right now, electricity is, is two approaching three terawatts. And um, so what I was showing you is that we have in the world right now about five, almost six in, in 2000, it's more than this. It's over uh, 600, 700 gigawatts of capacity of solar panels that have been put on the earth, but which is a decent fraction of terawatts, but they, they don't, they're not all in the sun at the same time. I mean, we have this you know, frustrating rotation that we have. So we, we can't get sunlight all the time. So on average, they produce about 15% of their capacity. So take that 600 gigawatts and multiply by 15%. That's the average power that we can get out from solar cells. So if you mm. want to go and produce two, three terawatts of uh, photovoltaic power um, on the earth, then what you need is we need to be increasing the total amount of solar on earth by a factor of 10, 15, just in round numbers. But the world is getting richer, more people want more energy. It is expected that by 2050, we would like not to be in the two, three, four terawatt region, but maybe in the 20, 30, 40 terawatt region. So at that scale, we really need to be increasing the portion of the earth that is covered by a larger fraction. Um, and we also need to deal with the fact that the sun goes down and the clouds come. And so there's grid management issues. And so th there is this question right now, we just mostly let markets and incentives take care of it. Where do we put solar cells? Where do we we save them is done and we don't, you know, some people might say, I don't like them nearby and other people say, well, I mean, you know, that's, that's what we do. I mean, it, it and, but on a scale of uh, the earth, there's a um, hundred thousand terawatts of sunlight arriving on the earth at all times. So we don't need to convert a very large fraction of the total sunlight on the earth in order to meet all of humanity's uh, energy needs. Having said that, you know, covering things that are decent fractions of, uh, of an Atlantic province. Um, you know, pe people have thoughts about it. Okay, thank you. Sure. I think we might have come to the end of the questions. Um, so maybe I'll ask Bob Boyne to join me on, and uh, to wind up the uh, Shallow Town, or this part of the Shallow Town Symposium. There will be uh, posters following it. But we want to say jointly uh, thank you to everyone who attended. So, Bob, can you join me? Sure. I don't know I, if you can or not. I don't know Maybe if I can or not. Well, I can certainly join you as a... Uh, as verbally, at least. As a member of the audience. Okay, so start my video. Okay. So... Uh, no, that's perfect. That's perfect. I'm not sure I have anything to say beyond what Paul said. But what Paul said was so important that you, you get to hear it twice. <laughs> uh, I, I, I want to thank everybody, uh, the, the speakers certainly, uh, and uh, the, the audience for uh, uh, their kind attention to this event. And uh, I'll come back next year. Uh, we're going to do it next year. That is, for absolute, that is absolutely for sure. 
and by then maybe we could hold it uh, in person uh, and wait for developments. We'll be in touch with you. Yes, so let me just also thank everybody for coming. This is our ninth year. So ninth year, the first time we've tried it virtually. Um, so that forced a change in format that's quite uh, profound. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we think it's successful, but we'll have some uh, discussion afterward to try to decide how we can improve it if, it if we're forced to be virtual again next year. I don't know if we will, maybe we won't. Um, but please now uh, don't, well, you have to leave this session, but please go to the poster session. We have nine posters and they're set up in poster rooms. So you can just go to one room to another, just like in a normal poster session and hear and meet the students, ask them as many questions as you wish. And at least the first time we tried this, which was on Wednesday, uh, we had enough time allocated that I think everybody got tired by the end. So I don't think you'll run out of time. So thank you again once more and uh, please go to the poster session.